Right, okay. It'll take at least two lectures to get through the material I'm covering here, which is why I've got rid of a one on presentation. So what I'll be talking about today is how the mainstream of economics does modelling. And this is a lecture you would not get at any other university outside Leeds, Greenwich and probably West England because most other university departments just teach the mainstream. In fact, they teach so much of the mainstream, they don't know there's any other way to model. I'm quite talking quite seriously here. They do not know there's any other way to model the economy apart from how they do it. And ironically as well, most of them don't know the, their own history of how they do modelling, which has changed quite radically over time. So what I'm going to be showing you is, is how they model and how it's changed over time and what has driven most of the changes. So one essential element of the mainstream is that microeconomics comes first. You're doing micro to some extent in a couple of the other courses? Okay. The, you know, supply and demand, all that sort of stuff, that's the foundation of how they think. So they have the study of consumers, products, markets, and demand, supply, and equilibrium, some common terms there. Macroeconomics is the behaviour of the total economy, the aggregate. And they really originally did not believe that there was such a thing. They thought if you know the micro, you know the entire economy. They saw the, the aggregate as like a very, very simple sum of what was happening at the micro level. Now we, we now have macroeconomics and we talk about growth, employment, inflation, income distribution, these sorts of issues as well. Um, so micro is the, the essence of microeconomics, not necessarily the essence of how markets themselves behave, but the essence of microeconomics is seeing you've got a demand schedule, a supply schedule, and they come into equilibrium, so demand equals supply by the price varying. That's the basic logic. So if you imagine looking at the rental market, the sort of picture they draw you is a vertical one showing the rent, a horizontal one showing the uh, number of household units uh, that are available to rent, a damp demand curve sloping down because the higher the price is, uh, the lower number of places that people actually would want, to, would want to rent, and then a rising supply curve is saying the more, the higher the rent being charged, the more uh, supplies provided. There's actually quite a bit of, not complex, but there's a mathematical argument behind that. Um, it isn't just saying people charge a higher price because there's more demand. Uh, but then they say there's an equilibrium price with an equilibrium quantity, and that's when they see the market functioning well. And their argument is that uh, this can be ruined by non-market interventions, and they treat the government and trade unions and, and to some extent also monopolies as non-market interventions there, meaning you get disequilibrium. So their vision of, a, of what might happen with the government, the government might impose rent control. And so with rent control, there's much higher demand because the price is lower, but there's also much lower supply for the same reason. So they'll say so there'll be um, demand will exceed supply and you'll get, uh, and their solution is get rid of the government intervention, abolish rent controls. You find that quite logical all the time. And they see, I'm actually missing an illustration here, they see that gap between demand and supply as being excess demand. Okay. Now equally you can have the price too high, there's excess supply. That's the sort of logic they have. Leave it to the market is pretty much the philosophy of mainstream economics. Now, they applied the same things to the labour market. When the Great Depression hit, you've all heard of the Great Depression. I don't think you realise just how bad the unemployment rate was. Uh, it was actually worse in America than it was in the UK. But what they saw was, well, the supply of labour exceeds the demand for labour at the current price, so the solution is cut wages. That was the type of argument that mainstream economists gave about how to solve the unemployment during the Great Depression because they thought it must be due to unions or minimum wage legislation and things like that. Um, and they thought the same thing had happened. So their model here is the same one, only now I've got the labour market, number of workers, the wage, uh, demand for labour, which there's going to be some, some supposed mathematical logic behind why it slopes down. Supply curve, they think that workers, if the wage rise is too low, they won't bother working. That makes sense to you? I hope not. Okay. If the wage is low, you've got to work many hours to stay enough to stay alive. So there's some silly elements to this theory. Okay, think, think carefully about it. If the wage is really lousy, you're going to be working your backside off, getting enough to stay alive. So it isn't valid at all to have an upward sloping supply curve, but that's, that's the mentality they have. And they think, well, there's the wage, the minimum wage is too high, uh, unemployment's the gap between the supply of labour at that wage and the demand for labour at that wage, so if you cut the wage, back to equilibrium again. 
which is a nice little theory, only it failed abjectly during the Great Depression, because if you take a look at the unemployment rate, this is using United States data, that's what happened in the Great Depression. Now, the way they measured unemployment there was actually recording how many people are registered as unemployed at what we would these days call a dole office. Okay? So it wasn't the survey approach we have today. It literally was zero percent of the economy, of the population in America was out of work in 1930, the end of 1930. Two years later, the unemployment rate was 26 percent. Now, their argument would be, well, there must have been a huge increase in the wage. Take a look at the data, it's not at all what happened. Money wages actually fell. So the blue line is money wages. You can see that should they, they peaked in 1928 and they fell quite substantially. And as they fell, unemployment rose, which is the opposite of what the theory would say happened. Now, that's money wages. Um, in fact, because deflation was so extreme, prices were falling by as much as 10% per year for the first couple of years of the Depression. So, of course, when prices are falling, if your money wages are falling as well, you might still be actually getting a higher real wage because prices may be falling faster than your wages. So I've got to then take a look at it and say, well, what happens when we... Uh, they're supposed to be animated, pardon me. I'll fix them up later. Um, what you actually find is the opposite because for a while, even though money wages are falling, Prices were falling not as rapidly as money wages, so real wages actually fell. But you still had a period, and that's where the, the first box is there. Um, I'll just actually move that out of the way so you can see more clearly. That's just unfortunately ob obstructing it. So there, ah, hang on, pardon me. I've got to go back to the original. Um, no, no, I'll leave it there. Hang on, no, I will go back and move it out of the way from here so you can see that more clearly. I meant that to come in as an animation. So if you take a look at this period, there's the real wage and it's declining, there's rising unemployment. Then the deflation ended, so prices weren't falling as fast. So in, in, in fact, you had rising real wages at that stage and rising unemployment. So you had two phenomena, one of which wasn't supposed to happen, the other which more fits inside their thinking, but clearly there was no... There wasn't a simple market solution to that problem. So the problem they had is wages were falling. Why didn't that stop the problem? Why did it keep on happening? So they had a real dilemma with the Great Depression. And that led to the development of macro because what Keynes was trying to do was to explain how you could have a slump in employment and output and everything else, even though wages were falling in both nominal and real terms. And that's when economic theory began to diverge very seriously. There have always been fights and disputes in economics over what is economic theory, how should you model the economy, and so on. They go right back to the 1800s, <coughs> even, in fact, right back to the mid-1700s. But at this stage, the profession really did diverge quite seriously because Keynes's explanation, which I'll cover in the lecture in two weeks' time, is talking about uncertainty about the future and how this can stop you investing and so on, and, and therefore you don't get growth. Whereas the neoclassicals developed their own explanation by a guy called J.R. Hicks. Ever seen his name before? Good. Okay, some of you have. Uh, he calls himself J.R. at this stage. I don't know what the... I think, I think it might stand for Richard, but John Richard, something like that, Hicks. Um, in his later papers, he calls himself John Hicks, and he says John Hicks and J.R. Hicks are two different people. Okay. Quite an intriguing thing to say. I'll explain that in two lectures' time. But what he wrote was what, he, what, he, what, he, what is called by economic theory a general equilibrium paper, a model of many markets rather than single markets. When you think about the model I showed you of labour supply and labour demand, you're treating that market in isolation from all other markets. Now, the point, and this is a valid point that the mainstream makes, is that when you look at the aggregate level, you must look at all markets at once. And therefore, one market can affect what happens in another market. So what he wrote was a model from a neoclassical point of view that attempted to model all markets at once and explain why this anomaly occurred of falling money and real wages but rising unemployment and an extended slump. Now, it's called Keynesian economics. It is not. Hicks actually admitted, when he started calling himself John Hicks, 
rather than J.R. Hicks, this is in the late 1970s, he said he developed the model before he had even read Keynes. He basically labelled it as a book review of Keynes and called it Keynesian Economics. But he wrote this paper in, uh, in 1937, <laughs> the one that gave rise to this model. But writing in 1979-80, he said, well, that's the fourth of major papers that I wrote across this period. He said, this one shows that the model was already in my mind before I read even, read even the first of my papers on Keynes. So what he described as a Keynesian model was actually a neoclassical one. And most economists don't realise that. That's the, a link to the paper where he admits that this is not a model of Keynes, it's a neoclassical model. So what it did was he modelled three markets using only two. Sounds strange? How can you leave out one market? You're modelling three, how do you model those three using two? Well, he was working on the idea of three-way exchange, conceiving what it calls a Volrasian matter. Now, Volras was the founder of one of the most, probably the most important founder of neoclassical economics, writing in the 1870s in France. And he said that he could represent three-way exchange. So A trades with B, trades with C. They've each got a different product to trade. Uh, you're working with A and B alone, you can ignore C. Why can you ignore C? It's because of what's called Volra's law, and that's that if you have, if there are three markets, so market for pigs, market for steel, and market for butter, let's say, if two of those markets are in equilibrium, then by Volra's law, the third one must also be in equilibrium. That's the logic. Now, I'm not explaining it here, but I want to make a little point here. What if you're not in equilibrium? Okay? What if you're not in equilibrium? Does the law apply? The answer is no. I can't give you the technical reasons in this course, but that's right. But he thought if you have two markets, you're modeling a three market system, and two of them are in equilibrium, then the third must be in equilibrium, therefore you can ignore it. And that's the logic behind his model. So you have, for example, the market for goods, the market for money, and obviously you've got to have the market for labour. But the ISLM model did not have the market for labour. Okay, he used Volra's law to say we can forget about that third market, then we can, therefore we can represent this on a two-dimensional diagram. So what he did was something that ended up looking like this. There's your little model of supply for the food market, supply and demand, microeconomics. That's what you got for macro. So rather than having goods on the a quantity of goods, an individual good on the horizontal axis, you have GDP in total. Rather than having price on the vertical, you've got the interest rate. But you've got the same basic idea, a downward sloping curve, an upward sloping curve, and everything happens where the two curves intersect. So that's the sort of model he got to. Now, the novel features, as I've said, it's got GDP on one axis, interest rate on the other. But the really novel thing was this thing called the LM curve, because what he said was, well, this is going to be sort of flat here and then vertical there. That's really what it came down to, whereas over here, normally what they draw is just the curve just slopes up with no change in slope. That's actually invalid. It should change in slope according to the neoclassical theory, but that's the way they think. Well, here he's saying well, we've got to think about this one being flat in the early section with low GDP and then going vertical with high GDP. So I want to show you how he got there. And looking back at the model that said I mean, cutting wages should solve the problem, that is, and here they're quite correct, partial equilibrium. You have an entire economy, lots of markets, you focus on one market, ignore all the others. Now, of course, you can do that with some isolated markets. So, I, for example, I could talk about the market for apples without worrying too much about the market for bananas or the market for labour and so on. But the market for labour, labour is used in every industry. Okay? Its demand is a large part of total demand. You can't ignore the rest of the economy and treat it in isolation. But the argument that just cutting the price will solve the problem was treating that market in isolation. Of course, if you cut the price of labour, what happens to people's workers' capacity to buy apples? It'll fall, won't it? Okay. So the feedback effects that you can ignore for a small, unimportant market, you can't ignore those feedbacks for a big, very important market. So you need what's called a general market where you have three. Um, in this case, you've got three markets. So what he, using Volra's law, he eliminated one, which has happened to be the labour market, and he said equilibrium in the goods market and equilibrium in the money market to describe the overall economy. So the I and S stands for investment and savings. 
and the L and M stands for liquidity and money. Okay. Now, when you get equilibrium of those, you get an output an equilibrium GDP and an equilibrium real interest rate. And that was combined with what came along later from a New Zealand economist called Bill Phillips of the idea of a trade-off between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate, and that explained inflation. So, so you've got, you got GDP, the interest rate, the level of uh, investment, real output, and then this add-on of the Phillips curve gave you the inflation rate. That's, that's the sort of thinking they had. But this was called Keynesian economics, but really it wasn't. Okay? It did not take the major innovations that Keynes wrote. It took, you could find some elements that look like this in Keynes, and people like Paul Krugman have done that, and they can say, look, here's this phrase, this is, this is just like what I modelled with ISLM. But a lot of the new stuff that Keynes came up with wasn't there to be seen at all. It just disappeared. So the simplest model in working out how the whole thing fits together, and again, this is more detail than you need for the course you're doing with me. Okay, It's just the stuff which I hope will prepare you for what you learn in second and third year. But the idea was the money supply was set from outside the market. So it's called an exogenous money supply. The word exogenous means originating from outside, derived externally. So it's not determined by the market. Uh, money demand, on the other hand, you saw as having two factors that determined it. The first is the interest rate. If you have a very high interest rate, you're better off giving your money to somebody to invest and getting a return on it. Okay, so a high interest rate means a low demand for money, but a low interest rate means a high demand for money because if you're not making much money out of not having access to your money by lending it to somebody else, you might as well hang on to it for yourself. So you get a downward sloping money demand curve uh, coming out of that. But the income side, well, the higher your income is, the more money you need for transactions. So there's two factors that determine it. And what Hicks came up with is this basic idea. There's your exogenous money supply. It's just fixed. The government can move that curve according to his model by changing reserves and uh, reserve ratios and stuff like that. So that can be moved, but it's not affected by the market at all. Then you have a money demand with an income level of one sloping downwards. The, the lower the interest rate, the more you're going to demand money. The higher the interest rate, the less money you're going to want because you want to lend your money to somebody else and get a return on it instead. There's a second uh, income level, demand, a demand level given income with a higher level of income. So what you get is two points in income and invest in interest rate. So what you can then do is use that diagram, take those points off, and rather than having M on the horizontal axis, now the money supply, I go across to, well, he had I there, I'll change that to Y later. That's, that's, that's the symbol that Hicks used for income. We use Y these days for income, so we'd have Y there. And then you take, there's one point, that's taking the two coordinates, the I point and Y1, because we've talked about the demand of that point being based on income level Y1. There's a second point. There's your LM curve, liquidity money curve. Now that's describing points of equilibrium in the money market. You're trading off money for liquidity. Okay. So that's one side. Is that okay? Okay. Now, the next one is the investment and savings. So this is the idea of a, another combination of interest rates and income that give you equilibrium in a neoclassical sense between demand for funds to invest and the supply of funds for investing. So looking at one side of it, with a high interest rate, very few firms are going to want to invest because they'll discount the income stream they expect to get out of the investment. A high interest rate means you're discounting the future income very severely, so only a small handful of projects are going to be profitable. With a low rate of interest, most projects are going to be profitable, you have a higher demand. Um, so you get this sort of um, combination for the demand. Then on the supply, the willingness of people to lend money is low if the interest rate is low, high if the interest rate is high. So what you get is this sort of diagram, and this is quite complicated to look at, but you, I think you'll see the logic. You have a downward sloping demand for funds for investment. The lower the interest rate, the higher the demand for funds. You have savings as a function of income, and the argument here was that the low income, you actually dis-save, but a high income, you'll save part of your income. Uh, in fact, have I got that the right point? 
Well, I better check that diagram. But that's the basic idea, upward sloping. Uh, the multiplier then tells you the relationship between investment and output. So we now have I investment and output on the, it's the same as the other diagram. And you use the 45 degree line to bounce the two around. That's what's going on there. So you take some particular point on, in, in, in the, um, on the bottom curve here, the level of demand, up here the level of savings supply. That gives you one point in I in income and interest rate space. You take another point, same sort of story, lo and behold a downward sloping curve. That's like your demand curve. You put the two together and you get this sort of story. There's the interest rate on the vertical axis, output on the horizontal, uh, there's your upward sloping, sorry, downward sloping ice curve, upward sloping liquidity money curve. Everything's supposed to happen in equilibrium. If I went too fast, let's go back and take a look at that one again. So bang, it just looks just like micro, doesn't it? Okay, only it's supposed to be covering two markets and being about macroeconomics. But what's left out of this is nothing about the price level. So there's a big hole somewhere in the theory, which we'll I'll go through that in a bit of detail. So now how do you explain this anomaly of falling wages and rising unemployment that occurred during the Great Depression using this model? And Hicks's logic was, well, the slope of this money demand curve, LM curve, or the, 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 uh, the, market, the curve that gives you equilibrium in the money market, that will probably be horizontal on the left and nearly vertical on the right. The logic being there's some minimum below which wage interest rates won't fall. So zero is a pretty obvious minimum for the reserve rate. Of course, we've had zero rates here for quite a while. Um, and there's a maximum level of income which you can generate with a certain amount of money. So, so the curve is likely to have two asymptotes. And he drew this diagram. There's the raw diagram. This is the modified one. So that's just sort of seeing like a typical a typical supply and demand curve. Here's what he thought was actually the case. So what it means is over here, if you can shift the IS curve that way, if you're over here and you can move this curve that way, you're going to boost employment and boost output without driving interest rates up all that much. But if you're over here and you try to do the same thing, most of the impact of boosting demand will drive up interest rates. That's the logic that they had. So what he said, you, you get this, again, this is actually just giving you more of his text. I won't bother reading that out, but you can get up, I'll basically cover the same points here. So he said it's the doldrum to the left of the diagram which upsets the classical theory. If you're in that area where the LM curve is, is flat, then changing the price of labour won't have much impact on demand for labour. Okay? But it's in the right, then you can increase the level of employment. Um, Oh, hang on. If, you, if you're in that area, then by increasing the amount of money in circulation, which the government can do by running a deficit, you can drive up demand and actually drive up employment without causing interest rates to rise. But if at the other side, uh, you, can't, you can't force them down any further. So what he said is um, that this is a role for government policy. If the government can move the IS curve in the diagram from where the LM curve is flat to where it's going vertical, you can boost employment and solve something like the Great Depression. And that's still the logic you'll find people like Paul Krugman putting in, um, in economics today. Now, Keynes argued against cutting the wage as a way of solving the unemployment problem. And his logic was, well, if you cut the wage, the wage is the main determinant of prices, so prices are likely to fall. The wage is also a major determinant of demand, so demand's likely to fall. The impact will be probably real wages don't change all that much by cutting money wages, and that's what we found empirically, and you might actually take demand out of the economy by doing it. So it's an argument against cutting money wages, an argument in favour of government spending to boost the economy. So according to Hicks, Keynes, this again is Hicks using Keynes as a, as a foil as he admitted later, it wasn't really a model of Keynes, it was a neoclassical model, but it's a way of coping with the fact that the model doesn't show at the macro level what you find at the micro when you have low, very low level of demand. Low level of demand, low interest rates, you can't actually increase demand by cutting interest rates anymore. The market itself won't solve things, so a government intervention can move the point out and boost employment. So this is, again, the, 
again, those two diagrams. And that's what he showed. The IS curve is there. If you have government spending, let's say that's, it, let's say that's your actual point of full employment there, uh, if the government can spend more and boost the economy, can move that IS curve out, and you get back to full employment. So you said that side of the diagram is the Keynesian world. This is the neoclassical world. Government policy, by adding just demand in the economy, can shift the curve out, get you out of a recession or out of a depression. And that became mainstream economics after the Great Depression. It's, pardon me, it's an enormous amount of text there. Again, I want you to have it. I've put these slides up on um, Canvas already, so you can actually look there and read through at your leisure. Okay. But this is just how Hicks explained the whole thing. I've given you pretty much the same explanation verbally. So on one side, he's saying uh, in the, the neoclassical region, the, the conventional theory is correct. Boost demand, you'll just cause interest rates to go up and you won't change much in the real economy. At the other region, however, boosting demand, you'll cause employment to rise without causing interest rates to rise particularly. So um, he said the Keynesian world applies in a, a slump, the neoclassical world applies in a boom. And that's how people reconciled the two theories um, after the Great Depression. So the policy prescription was government spending can shift you out of that period where you've got a, the demand is so low that the Ellen curve is horizontal. And what it means by being horizontal is that you're in what uh, people like Paul Krugman call the quiddity trap. No attempt to boost demand using monetary policy will work at that level because interest rates are already zero. Okay? So you can't modify things by money demand. You can modify it by government spending. So that's the overall argument. And it's derived from a neoclassical way of thinking, but it runs counter to that microeconomic partial equilibrium way of thinking. And this annoyed a lot of neoclassicals because they really want micro and macro to be consistent. And I said their mindset is such that microeconomics rules. So they were very annoyed about this particular model. And nonetheless, it appeared to work pretty well for the first 20 years. So if you take a look at the, uh, the data, uh, it, it seemed to work until the mid-1960s. Now, remember that curve, Just all, all you had were in, interest rate on the vertical axis, GDP on the horizontal. You had nothing about the rate of inflation or the level of prices. So to solve that, uh, along came the idea of the Phillips curve. And what actually happened here was Bill Phillips was an engineer, <coughs> an incredibly innovative engineer. There's just a bit of a, a tale about him. He was, he, he was a New Zealander, fought in the Second World War and got captured by the Japanese and was imprisoned on an island in the Pacific along with a lot of other people. And... The, prison, the prisoner of war camp, of course, had electricity supplied by generators the Japanese owned. And Bill Phillips worked how to steal some of the electricity to produce tea for the English prisoners. Okay. It involved he had to break into the commandant's office to steal some of the devices he needed. And then at a later stage, he found an abandoned bus on the island <clears throat> and he started working out how to turn it into a ship. So we're talking about one hellish, incredibly innovative, impressive human being. And he's an engineer. So he's applying engineering ideas to the economy. And as part of it, he talked about a trade-off between the level of economic activity and how much wages would rise. So he had this hypothesis that um, the rate of change of money wages, notice it's money wages, can be explained by the level of unemployment, so the lower the level of unemployment, the more workers can demand wage rises. The rate of change of unemployment, now this, I'm putting this in italics because most economists aren't aware, most economists have not read any of the original literature that I'm going through here. Okay. They read textbooks, which is one reason I don't use textbooks. If you read the original, you find Phillips has three factors here. All you'll see in any textbook about it is one factor, which is the unemployment rate. If you said it's the unemployment rate, the rate of change of unemployment, uh, and then also inflation caused by basically uh, coming in from overseas, a rapid rise in import prices. So he had three factors. What he did was he went back and over a weekend, oh, pardon me, that's a repeat slide there. Uh, he went back over a weekend, he grabbed a, a manual calculator, and he went through the English data from 1867 to 1917 
to derive a curve. Now, I've left out one of the slides, so I've got to change the order of the slides. But notice what he's saying here. Ignoring years where import prices rise rapidly enough to cause a, wa cause a wage price spiral. So he can see a feedback between wages and prices causing runaway inflation. And he said it normally happens during war. And assuming productivity rises about 2% per year, it seems from the relationship further to the data that if you kept aggregate demand where prices were stable, then you'd have an unemployment rate of 2%. And if you kept uh, wages stable, unemployment would be 5%. Those are a lot lower rates of unemployment that we talk about these days, aren't they? So the economy is doing a lot better in the historic period that uh, he was looking at than they are now. But that was the logic. So he's arguing there's a trade-off between the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. And that became the idea of a menu, uh, a trade-off between the two. So what you have here is data. The curve was derived from data between 1861 and 1913. It's a historical data you had on the inflation rate and the unemployment rate in the UK by tacking together a whole large number of data series mainly derived from trade union records about unemployment and then government records about inflation. And then, so this is data from 1861 to 1913. Now look at the results. There's 1949. Let's, let's go, where did it say we start? 48, 49, uh, 51 up here a bit, 52. They're all very close to the curve. And so people looked at it and thought, hell, this must be a stable relationship. And what it implies is if we actually can set, somehow set the uh, unemployment rate so that it's 2.5%, then we'll have um, um, stable prices. If we want stable wages, we've got to have a high level of unemployment. We have a choice between the two. It's like a menu. Which one do you want, stable prices or stable wages? And it's a nice, easy relationship. Change the level of government spending to get to that point, and you've got an economy that you're controlling. So this was the, the mindset that applied in the 1950s and 60s. Um, well, not actually 1960s is better, because it was actually the data, with the paper was written, I think, in 1963. So the idea was the government would change the level of spending, more spending when unemployment was low, less spending when it... Sorry, more spending when unemployment was high, less when it was low, change the level of the economy, you'll get an unemployment rate and an inflation rate somewhere on this curve. That's the mindset that politicians had. And they were pretty happy at that stage because it would look, like, look quite simple. Now, it seemed to work until 1965. You had low unemployment throughout the whole period, low inflation. And this is just looking at the data now in the United States. Unemployment rate way, way up here. This is the Great Depression. Then it's down here. You had a spike in prices because of the Korean War, which drove up prices quite dramatically. But throughout the whole period, you're seeing unemployment not going much beyond 8%, often being about 4%. You're seeing the inflation rate as being as low as zero in the 1950s, but pretty stable, pretty low. So that's why they call this the golden age of capitalism. Okay. Workers were doing pretty well. Inflation rate was low. But then inflation began to rise. So you can see here, inflation's getting higher. Unemployment's falling, which looks consistent with the menu approach that Phillips used. So there's a boom going on here, but there's rising inflation. Then, after a while, you got rising inflation and rising unemployment. So that was seen as being contradictory at the Phillips curve in the same way that the idea of falling wages and rising unemployment was contradictory of the neoclassical vision back in the Great Depression. So you plot this actually showing the, the way the data works. It starts here, and that's, that's the way the actual relationship went. So what you have in general is rising inflation and rising unemployment. So it was another, another dilemma, like the Great Depression had been for the neoclassicals beforehand, this was a new dilemma for people that saw themselves as Keynesian. Now, I know I've only given about what, 35 minutes of a lecture so far, but I'm about to change tack fairly heavily here. So this might be a good point to take our break. Come back at, at, at uh, 1 o'clock, and I'll give you the next half of the lecture. This particular set of slides will take at least four hours to get through. So I want you to take that away, think about it, have a cup of coffee, come back in 10 minutes, okay?
was an apparent breakdown of the Phillips Curve relationship. But I want you to take a better look at this because when you take a look at the data itself, what was happening in those years? Well, 1971, 70, all that appeared was the Vietnam War. And just like the Korean War drove up prices, so did the Vietnam War. So that was the wage price spiral that Phillips mentioned as a potential, one of the other two factors. Over here you had OPEC increasing oil prices by a factor of four and doing it again in 1979. So there are reasons that fit within what Phillips is talking about for why that might apparently break down. So the wage price spirals going on in both cases. And the menu interpretation of Phillips was wrong. Now he actually, in his article, he did say something that looked like a menu. You know, do you want fries with that sort of McDonald's approach to uh, the economy? But he had these other two factors, the rate of change of employment and cost of living adjustments. Now that gives you a, not just a, a simple trade-off between two factors, but there are actually four factors there. The inflation rate itself plus three causal factors. Uh, and he also had a dynamic model in mind. I'll show you more of this in two weeks' time, but Phillips was actually an engineer. This is an engineer's diagram of a dynamic model of the economy. And what he was doing was finding, I think it was actually uh, this little factor here, he was trying to get uh, a graph to fit in there, and I'll show you that. There we are. That's the graph he actually drew by hand in 1957 before he did this research in 58, 59. So Heath was actually trying to build a dynamic model, not a static one, not a simple trade-off. Things were changing over time rather than sitting still. Now, his dynamic argument was ignored, and the menu trade-off was used instead, and then it broke down. So he was accused of getting it all wrong. And what actually happened was that gave a, a reason for the neoclassicals to get back to what they preferred to believe. So there's a breakdown in this model. There is not a trade-off, it appears, between inflation and unemployment. So along comes Milton Friedman. You heard of his name, I imagine? Who hasn't heard of Milton Friedman? Okay, some of you are lucky. Uh, but he said that, in fact, it's all about equilibrium again. And he brought us back to a, a sort of pre-Great Depression vision of the economy once more. He said, first of all, he said there's a natural tendency to full employment. So the experience of the Great Depression in that sense is forgotten. Uh, and he said the, the full employment is where it's labour supply equals labour demand. But there was a huge gap between the two in the Great Depression. And he saw supply as being determined by people's willingness to work versus therefore losing leisure time. So that's your labour-leisure trade-off. And demand coming from what's called the marginal product of labour, which affects how much profit uh, firms are making out of hiring workers. And you saw the money um, money just hitting the absolute price level, not relative prices. And he argued relative prices are what matters. And the key paper he wrote here was called The Optimum Quantity of Money. So he's saying how much money should an economy have given its level of, of GDP? And it was a very, very stylized model of the economy. I'll take you through the details in the next couple of slides. But what he assumed, and I'm going to come back to this when I talk about uh, non-orthodox modelling in two lectures' time, he assumed that the government was, the money was completely controlled by an external non-market system. Have you heard of the idea of helicopter money? Okay, you haven't. All right, well, nonetheless, this became a popular term. He's, as if money dropped out of the sky from a helicopter. It was just tokens dropped by something non-market, non flowing over the top of the market economy. That's the vision that he had. Uh, so in that case, if money's falling out of the sky, and you can just pick it up and use it, it's an asset for you, it's not a liability for anybody else. But if you think about money you get from a bank, if you use your credit card to get money, so you go, let's say you go buy your lunch with your credit card today, then you get the money to buy the lunch, but you get a, which is an asset you can use, but you get an identical liability, you owe money to the bank. Okay. Now this is money that's falling out of the sky. An asset, not a liability, and would you believe it, we have both rain and too much light in an English lecture theatre. So hang on a sec. Can somebody put those blinds down? Otherwise you won't be able to see the screen. Thank you. Hilarious. Won't last long. That's a fairly common experience in Australia, by the way, but not here. Okay. So 
He started off by imagining he had an economy that was in long run equilibrium. So everything is fine. Full employment, not the sort of situation we saw in the Great Depression. Thanks very much for that. So he said a hypothetical, simple society with a stationary state. So there's no change in GDP, no change in population, no change in technology. Uh, and he said the people are immortal. They never die and they never change. Know anybody like that? Um, and he said that aggregates change. So aggregates are con constants. So there's no change in GDP, no change in um, number of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But individuals might have some individual some change themselves. Um, there's competition, and he said, let's add a couple of special provisions there. He said all money consists of strictly fiat money, i.e., pieces of paper, each labelled this is one dollar. So there's no banking system, and there's no credit, and no debt, no private debt. Not the world we live in. Okay. And this is one of the big mistakes that neoclassicals will do all the time. You can see I'm a critic. I'm quite happy to say that. They'll make a set of assumptions, which they say are simplifying assumptions. But what they actually do is invent a world that doesn't exist. Okay? This world doesn't exist. And yet they use that world to say what happens in the real world. Sorry, that is not simplifying assumption. That is a fantasy. But anyway, with this fantasy, he said... Uh, inflation is caused by a helicopter, here's even more fantasy, flying overhead and dropping additional $1 bills. And so let's say a helicopter flies over and he starts the model with $1,000 in circulation and a second $1,000 drops out of the sky and people think it'll never happen again. They grab the pieces of paper. So here we have this idea of a helicopter flying over this economy and dropping dollar bills out of the top of it, which people then collect and that doubles the money supply. Okay. Either what this will do is there'll be a brief spurt of extra, extra economic activity. So you're already in equilibrium, there's full employment. Okay. What happens is people think, well, actually, there's twice as much demand all of a sudden. So they work a bit harder, they produce more output, but all that tends to happen is prices rise over time. So he said as they do this, after a while, prices will double, and then you'll get back to equilibrium again. This is his hypothetical world. And then he imagines, it, let's say, you've got a continuous stream of helicopters doing this. So they're always flying over. They're always dropping money out of the top. He said people start to get used to this. So they factor in that prices are going to rise every year because of these stupid helicopters dropping money over the country. And if their money was supply was increasing by 10% per annum because of these helicopters, then people would expect prices to go up by 10% every year, so people would automatically start putting up their prices by 10% a year. So what you have is inflation being driven by the expectation that this money is going to turn up and cause inflation. And what this gives you is a rising level of prices with a constant level of unemployment. So what he saw was this sort of relationship. Here's the inflation and unemployment diagram as Philip saw it. And then he, what Friedman assumes is there's a natural rate the economy will always return to here, which is full employment. There's a change in the money supply because the government's trying to push the unemployment rate to below full employment, trying to push the unemployment rate below where you have full employment. So let's say the full employment rate's 5%, the government's trying to achieve 2%. Now, in fact, when you go back to where did macroeconomics come from? It was the Great Depression when unemployment was 26%. Now, that wasn't full employment. So he's leaving that type of real element of the real world out. But he says, the government sets this target. For a while, this is your little temporary Phillips curve now. There's the trade-off that appears to apply. But people then realise, in fact, there isn't an increase in real demand. There's just been an inflation increase in money demand. So they expect, expect inflation to be non-zero. Down here, they're expecting inflation of zero. Now they expect inflation of, say, 5%. So the economy returns to the previous equilibrium, and then the government tries to do the same thing. Expectations are gap. They now expect 10%. And what you get is a series of these upward-sloping, short-term Phillips curves, but the long-term one is vertical. Yeah? What is the delta MS? Pardon? 
Oh, change the name. Delta means change. So change in the money supply. Delta M. Yeah, that's the change in the money supply. That's the helicopter. Thank you for asking that. So that's the. I use a lot of shorthand in some of my slides. I've elaborated some, but that's the change in the money supply. So what you get is inspected inflation becomes the change in the money supply minus the change in labour productivity. And if the government keeps on pushing this up or this remains constant, then Philip Friedman says you're just going to get a rising level of inflation and no change in the unemployment rate. Okay. So that's the sort of model that he had in mind. So what he said is you need accelerating inflation to sustain the target. If this is the target the government sets, which is a lower level of unemployment than gives you full employment, so you're wanting to target effectively what we might call over full employment, you can do it if you're willing to tolerate accelerating inflation. And that's what, when you look back at that diagram a couple of slides earlier, that was what was happening between 1968, roughly, and 1980, this accelerating rate of inflation. So what he sees is you get short-term gain, you, you do drive the unemployment rate down in this model, but you get the cost of that is an accelerating, not just a higher rate of inflation, but inflation getting faster every year. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which you'll see economists talking about for quite some time. This is the target they wanted. This here they say that's that is what being on that line gives you what they call Nehru. So Milton Friedman invented the term non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Okay. Does it exist? Is it a real thing? That's what he invented. So what you got out of that was an argument that if your government tries to do this, you're going to have runaway inflation, you're not going to lower the unemployment rate, and it was an argument against the government doing that and saying just what the government should do is set a target for a constant rate of unemployment and a constant rate of inflation. Um, but that wasn't good enough for many of the neoclassicals because it still argued, when you look at it, that if the government and the public is willing to tolerate accelerating inflation, you can have a lower level of unemployment than the so-called natural rate. And what the end goes on here, you have an increase in the money supply, that gives you a lower unemployment rate, rate and a high level of output. Then expectations adapt, so you fall back to the original level. So you increase the money supply yet again, you get a lower unemployment rate. Ultimately, it's saying the government can cause a lower rate of unemployment if it's willing to tolerate accelerating inflation. Now that angered a lot of neoclassicals. They didn't like that. They want to say that the market, the government can't make things better in a market economy. They want the government out of the way. There is really an ideological bias in mainstream economics against the government. So the only way they could get rid of that was to say, well, in fact, this won't work because people can predict the future. Sounds crazy? It is crazy. Okay. But that became the way they thought about it. So this is, again, it's too much text in one go, but this is the guy who began the real neoclassical fight back called Robert Lucas. And he said it's natural to an economist to see the cyclical correlation of changes in output and changes in prices as arriving from a volatile demand curve, so you get a demand curve moving up and down, with a stable supply curve. Okay. Now that's at the micro level. They're quite happy to draw that sort of diagram at the micro level. But in the macro level, they want to have a vertical supply curve. And he says that in the next statement here. He says that this is a paradox because the absence of money illusion. Now, this is saying that people are assumed not to be fooled by nominal changes. All they worry about is real changes. And nobody worries about their money wage. They're only concerned about their real wage. That's a very neoclassical way of thinking. He said that implies a vertical supply curve. And therefore, fluctuations in the demand curve, if you have a vertical supply curve, all the fluctuations in demand can do is drive prices up and down. So why are you supposed to get this idea of a, a ability to change prices using inflation and also change the level of supply? He said, we can resolve this paradox by assuming that short-term behaviour differs from long-term behaviour, and that's what is called adaptive expectations, which Friedman was using. So people, first of all, get surprised by the new money turning up. They then work harder. Then they realise, in fact, there's no actual increase in real demand. They work more slowly. You get a, a boost in the inflation rate, no change in employment. That's adaptive. You learn from experience. But that wasn't good enough for Lucas. 
He said that the standard, this is actually quoting him, the standard hypothesis of adaptive expectations leads to an inadequate formulation of the natural rate hypothesis. Now, what does he mean there? He said there's an argument in economic theory, mainstream neoclassical economic theory, that the economy has a rate of unemployment it will always return to, which is that supply and demand idea, the natural rate. That's what the unemployment rate should be. So if we believe there's a natural rate, adaptive expectation says you can move away from the natural rate permanently. That's not good enough. So we need to get something else which can get us back to the argument the economy always returns to this natural rate of unemployment. And what he called this is rational expectations. Now, if I said I knew somebody who could predict the future accurately, would you describe that person as rational or prophetic or insane? Okay. They commandeer the word rational to mean somebody who can predict the future accurately. Now, on that basis, there are a handful of rational people, all of whom are gods, depending upon your religion, or Nostradamus. It's not an empirical problem. It's a case of belief, because what neoclassicals want to do is argue there's no relationship between monetary changes and real variables, except the rate of inflation. So this is a proposition, fundamentally, that people can predict the future. And that really, as Keynes identified back in the Great Depression, that's the essential fallacy of neoclassical economics. Writing back in 1937, Keynes said that, I accuse the classical, and by he means classical, he means what we call neoclassical today. I include the classical economic theory of being one of these pretty polite techniques which tries to deal with the present by abstracting from the fact that we know very little about the future. There's Keynes talking about uncertainty in the future. But what has actually happened now is, rather than Keynes's contemporaries ignoring the fact that they don't know the future, the modern neoclassical started saying people can actually accurately predict the future. Just one stage worse. Now, why doesn't it rescue, why doesn't Milton Friedman's idea rescue neoclassical vision? Well, if you have, and this is again the same point I've mentioned earlier, but quoting Lucas now, uh, inflation will really yield high real output only if price expectations, so people's expectations of what the inflation rate is going to be, fall below um, actual prices or actual inflation. He said adaptive expectations don't reel out this bias. So here's the possibility. People are going to be perennially wrong, under, underestimating the rate of inflation. So there's then a trade-off. He said the only way to preserve what we prefer to believe, which is that the real economy sets the level of output and monetary factors determine absolute prices. The only way to restore what we believe is to replace adaptive expectations where you learn from experience, which is effectively delayed learning of what's going on now, with rational expectations where you can immediately predict the future and then respond to what you know is going to happen in the future. Now, that became the essence of what's called rational expectations, macroeconomics. So you see in the economy is always in long run equilibrium. Relative prices are set by technology and tastes, what firms do and what consumers want. Okay. All inflation is caused by money supply growth. The government completely controls the money supply. So there's no banks creating money. I'll explain that in more detail in two lectures time. Uh, and rational agents can predict what's going to happen to the inflation rate if the money supply rises. So they, rather than reacting with a time lag to the helicopter flying over the country and dropping dollar bills, as soon as they see the helicopter, they put prices up before the money even hits the ground. So this is the idea that people can, because people can predict the future, that behavior doesn't change because of the helicopter and put that as Hal Lucas actually said it, the hypothesis of adaptive expectations, the stuff that Milton Friedman talked about in the helicopter money, was rejected on the grounds that under some policy, there can be a gap between actual inflation and expected inflation, leading people to work harder so monetary changes have a real impact. Now notice this, if the impossibility of a non-zero value, which actually is making it complicated and hard to understand, what he's really saying, if if, to get our theory to work, we have to assume people can accurately predict the inflation rate, one is led to doing one of two things. 
we can add the assumption that people can accurately predict the inflation rate as an axiom. We can just assume that everybody can accurately predict the inflation rate. Now, that's madness, isn't it? It's obvious madness. He said, or we can assume expectations are rational, as a guy called Muth, who first invented this concept, said them. So what they did was bring in what they call rational expectations, and the language itself makes it look like rational, that's sensible, this is what normal sane people do, we should take the economist seriously. But you look at it, he's saying, we are assuming people can predict the future. Now, if they actually said what he's got up here, one is led to, a, to the assumption that it's zero, simply as an axiom, that's mad. Tell a politician, we're assuming the public can predict everything in the future. The politician wouldn't take your advice. They'd call guys and women with a van to take you off to a mental asylum. But you say we're talking about rational expectations, it sounds convincing. And that's what actually happened. So what they were doing was to get back to the stage where everything was determined by microeconomics. That's why I started by saying to them micro rules. Micro is where everything comes from. And here's Lucas again talking a couple of decades later. Uh, this was a speech he gave to historians of economic thought. And the speech was simply transcribed. So it's not prepared remarks, not written down as carefully and, and as boringly as this is. He's just talking away and saying, why did I do this? Well, he said back when I was an undergraduate a graduate student, nobody was satisfied with RSLM. The idea was his generation were going to tie micro and macro together. That was our task. And they wanted to get macro having the same conclusions that micro had. So we're back to that supply and demand vision once more. Okay. The single market view, the partial, what Hicks called partial equilibrium, they want to make that the result of macroeconomics as well. So there's the madness. There's the way it was described by saying it was uh, rational expectations. Now, again, what neoclassicals themselves don't tend to know is they don't learn the history of economic thought. Okay. I've been in several universities now. I used to teach history of economic thought at... Um, the University of New South Wales, and while I was teaching there, the department abolished not just the teaching of the history of economic thought, but also abolished the teaching of economic history. Okay. Now, you're at a very unusual university because we teach you both here. But most universities, if you're at Cambridge University or Oxford, you would not be learning either the history of economic thought or economic history. You would just be learning their current models. So they don't know where their own ideas came from, and in a fundamental way, they don't really know what happened in the past either. So what the 1970s neoclassicals wanted was a macro that was consistent with the microeconomics. And this all came in, uh, Lucas played a role, so did these two other, or three other economists, Kidlin, Prescott and Sargent. They invented what was called real business cycle theory. And the idea was to derive macroeconomics quite directly from the vision of a utility maximising consumer, and the consumer is making a choice between working, which means earning an income, and leisure, which you have if you're not working. So a labour leisure trade off was seen as what the consumer is doing. And then a firm, which is profit maximising. So firms deciding how much to produce to get the maximum level of profits, not just at a point in time, but for the rest of history. So the consumer is choosing a combination of labour and leisure, which maximises consumer utility forever, not just at a point in time. And the firm is doing the same thing, to maximise the net present value of profits forever. And then the market brings the two together. So this is again back to the vision of a perfectly functioning market economy where the government can do no real good. And it was derived as an extension of neoclassical growth theory. This is going to get very hairy, OK? Um, don't worry if you don't quite comprehend it on the first time through, but I'm trying to put this stuff in context for you now so you'll know how people who learn this theory without seeing the criticisms of it are actually thinking. So what they began with was a paper from 1925 by a guy called Ramsey. He was a, a young polymath. I think he died at about the age of 28. So he wrote this paper when he's in his mid-20s. And his question he asked himself is, is there an optimal rate of savings? Now remember, if you define income as being you can either consume what you earn or you can save what you earn, then given a given level of income, more savings means less consumption. 
Okay. So you're saying, is there some ideal rate for savings where those savings then enable investment to occur? And he said, how much of an income should a nation save? And he, to actually answer it, he said, I've got to make some simplifying assumptions. Now look at what they were. The first is that we can add up utility. Simply add, utility is easy to calculate. We can add, individuals can add the utility they get from consuming different things, and we can add together the utility you get versus one matter utility that, say, Rupert Murdoch gets out of consuming <coughs> other stuff. We ignore distribution, so we don't worry about workers versus capitalists or bankers versus capitalists, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we assume there's no possibility of future generations um, consuming what we save. They're going to continue investing like we are. And there won't be any crises. Misfortunes which can sweep away accumulations will not occur. So there'll be no Great Depressions and there'll be no earthquakes, etc., etc. Everything's nice and smooth. And then what you got was output was just a simple function of how much labour and capital you put together. And you worked that in terms of a intensity, the ratio of machinery to workers. And you reached equilibrium where that ratio of capital workers of machines to workers was constant. That's your equilibrium there. And you then used a single... If you used, you've done indifference curves yet in micro? OK. It's, you know the idea of isoquants when you look at a weather map and you see those lines they join showing points of equal pressure? Well, indifference curves are similar in economic theory, mainstream economic theory, that you can draw a line connecting the amounts you're consuming of different commodities and say, anywhere along this line, I get the same satisfaction. Okay? Now, that's what they try to do to drive your individual demand. But this is saying we can use that for the entire society, which means, of course, we don't have to worry about whether you get more or less income than Rupert Murdoch. Okay? You can add your utility to the wealthiest people in the world and there's no social conflict, et cetera, et cetera. So there are pretty enormous holes, holes in the model. Now, what they talk about, uh, what was being discussed by Ramsey is an idea of, a, of somebody coordinating and decide how much we should all consume and save. Now they talk about things like a social planner. Now, is it a bit strange to have a model of capitalism where they presume you have a social planner? That's a model of socialism, not capitalism. That's what starts to turn up in their thinking here. Now, there's a lot of mathematics behind this, and I, you know, I think actually in third year we might attempt to show you some of it. But what you get is this point of equilibrium between the demand side of the economy and the production side actually looks like a saddle, like a horse's saddle. Now, that direction, if you dropped a ball bearing or a, you know, a tennis ball, precisely on that curve, it might fluctuate slightly to get to this point. But if you don't drop it precisely on the arch there, it'll slide off. Okay? So mathematicians treat that as an unstable equilibrium. You won't actually reach it. There's two axes, one of which is stable and the other is unstable. Now, the only way you can actually get to the point here, if you sort of try to throw a tennis ball from a distance and get it to land on a horse's saddle, you've got to land precisely along here. Okay? Forget it. You can't do it. They assume you can all do it. You're all doing this to work out how much to consume and how much to work. So mathematicians treat that as unstable. The odds you actually get there is zero. But what economists said is, oh, we're all rational. We can predict where this curve is. We can jump to the point that will put us on the stable arch and we can fluctuate and get there over time. So this is what they started saying. Now, Ramsey, Ramsey was saying, is there an optimal rate for an entire society? If it's an optimal rate of savings, then you might not necessarily be saving that much at this point in time. Since it's unstable, the only way to get there is to adjust consumption and investment and savings now so you move from a current position which won't reach the equilibrium point in the future to the curve that will get you there. And he called it the bliss point. So to actually get to this, because the future is unstable, or the point in the future is unstable, you have to move now to the right curve to get there. You can't get there any other way. Now, he, Ramsey just was talking about if there was a social planner. 
what the modern neoclassical said is, we're going to assume you're all social planners, you all know where this saddle is in the future, you can therefore all work out where that unstable, where the, where the sole stable way of getting there is, and if, you, if the saddle moves its location, you can move to the new curve that's defined by the new saddle. So they talk about having shocks in technology, which is a change in how firms produce output, and that changes the capital labour equilibrium, and shocks to preferences, so people change their tastes between labour and leisure and so on. So apparently you lot are more hardworking than my generation, so you work harder. Millennials work harder than baby boomers. So the saddle will move, and then the whole economy will jump to the stable curve that will get you that point in the future. So this is, this is Ramsey's vision. And therefore, if, there's, if it happens the saddle moves to a position where you've got to um, have more leisure, so you work less, everybody decides to work less, and the recorded unemployment rate rises. If you instead have the saddle moving in such a way that you've got to uh, produce more output now, then people work harder, and you get a parent boom. But it's supposed to be equilibrium no matter what. These are the real business cycle models. So they saw the business cycle as optimal reactions. You're always in equilibrium. The saddle in the future moves. That changes the current point of equilibrium between consumption and savings. So you change your consumption and savings decisions now to be on the stable path no matter what. So in that case, even the Great Depression was a holiday for workers. They decided they wanted to work less. They wanted to relax more during the 1930s. So all those soup kitchens you saw were people actually relaxing and having a good time. I wish I was being facetious, but I'm not. So here's what they see happening. Here we are now. There's this bliss point, which is the stable point on that saddle way in the future. There's the current path to get you to that combination over time. So you've, you've got to be, that's where you've got to be right now. So new information arrives about the future. Technology changes or consumption patterns change. So the new future bliss point might be down here somewhere. And therefore the new path is different. So to get there, what you've got to do is change your current labour leisure trade-off, bump up to here, and that movement between one spot and the other is recorded as an increase in consumption, therefore a boom's going on. Um, so you... But, but any level of unemployment is still the e equilibrium. It's still optimal. Are you head spinning yet? Okay. What you get in Cambridge, I'll teach you this as though it's true, I'm going to get you doing the mathematics of it in first year. So we're getting a slightly more realistic world here. So what they saw is optimal shifts, utility maximising, profit maximising shifts, were actually what were recorded as the trade cycle. And there was no real trade cycle. Now, how do you explain reality that way? Well, and I'm not joking, this is actually a paper by one of those people. It's by Kidland. Sorry, by Prescott. High unemployment was the result of, say, government policies which reduced the level of competition, and it was voluntary. You have a policy that raises wages, reducing output. That affects competitive wage. The lower wage means there's... Um, Let's see. Reduce employment. So people choose to have leisure rather than to work for a low wage. So wages fell during the Great Depression. People decided to work less. It just wasn't worth their time to get out of bed and go to work. You know, they lay around and somehow enjoying consuming with no income. Now, they literally said it was voluntary, and this is uh, Edward Prescott said, from the perspective of growth theory, the Great Depression was a great decline in steady-state market hours. It wasn't involuntary unemployment. It was voluntary unemployment. He says, um, this was the unintended consequence of changes to labour market institutions and industrial policy by the government, implicit, which is implicit there, designed to improve the performance of the economy. Now, he couldn't identify what they were. He said, from his point of view... The explanation for the Great Depression was workers wanted a holiday because there was some change that made it not worth their while to work as hard. That's in a paper called Some Observations on the Great Depression. So here is, again, the same sort of argument again. 
if the economy is not in equilibrium, they're blaming the government for the fact that it's out of equilibrium. Even when you're talking about the Great Depression and also now they're starting to talk that way about the 2008 crisis as well. So again, this comes back to the anti-government bias this theory of economics has. Anything that goes wrong in a capitalist economy, they blame on the government. Even the Great Depression. Give them enough time, they'll blame the crisis we've been through in 2008 as the cause of the crisis. Let's go back and see where this comes from in microeconomics because here's, here's actually Kidlin continuing. Uh, and this is writing back in 1999, by the way. So you had a, the boom that was going on in 1999 was the, the dot-com bubble with the beginning of the subprime bubble in America. So it's a booming economy, and they were convinced they were responsible for the boom. So here he's saying something about Marxian, Marxian view. Capitalist economies are inherently unstable, and excessive accumulation of capital will lead to increasingly severe economic crises. How does that look to you as a view of the world today? Not too far from reality, I think, after the crisis. You said growth theory says this is not true. The capitalist economy is stable and absent rules change the rules of the game. The economy will double every few years. In the 1930s, there was some change in the rules of the game, in other words, government policy. Uh, and that's what actually happened. And here's, here's the statement that unemployment during the Great Depression was not a market failure. Um, employment was not low because investment was low. Investment in employment were low because labour market regulations changed in a way that lowered normal unemployment. So in other words, the unemployment during the Great Depression when one in every four workers was out of a job was actually in equilibrium, a utility maximising equilibrium. Now, that was just too much for some other neoclassicals. Again, there's a lot of politics and economics even within the mainstream. So the people who put this view together are called freshwater economists because the universities they came from are places like Minnesota, Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. And those universities are based on the, the great rivers of America. But the most of the opponents happen to come from Princeton, Harvard, and so on, and they're coastal universities. They call themselves saltwater economists. So they said, look, this is just crazy. To say the Great Depression was a utility maximising event is just too extreme. Even for us fans of capitalism, this is too extreme. So they said instead, uh, we need to change the model so that it can be out of equilibrium. So you can be in a situation you don't want to be. And what they said was, well, what their model assumed is perfect competition, perfectly rational behaviour, perfect capacity to predict the future, which are extreme assumptions. So we're going to be more realistic and say there are monopolies, all markets aren't competitive, people take a while to learn, they don't learn straight away. So therefore, we still think the economy is stable, but if some shock comes along and moves it out of equilibrium, it'll take a while to get back there. And these frictions are the things that slow it down. So they assumed there was imperfect competition in the product market. So you had monopoly, monopolies or a small number of firms in the product market, the consumer good market they normally assume is competitive. And there are trade unions. What it means is prices are sticky. They don't instantly give you equilibrium again, whereas the neoclassical vision is prices give you flexibility all the time. So here's one of the, he's actually an Australian, this guy, uh, writing about his own model and saying the assumptions of nominal wage rigidity, so wages take a while to adjust, uh, and an explicit role for money is what gives you macroeconomic characteristics, ultimately we'll get back to equilibrium. So the difference was the extreme neoclassicals, the real business cycle, RBC people, they assume you're always in equilibrium, there's no delay to get back there. The, the saltwater ones, what they call DSGE models, they think there are frictions that slow down how fast you get back there. But they still have the, the same fundamental view of the economy. So what they came up with is saying that the government now has a role because the government can control the interest rate through the central bank. So they thought if you set the interest rate right and if you vary the interest rate to stop inflation taking off or to, to cause a boom when in inflation's falling, um, then you can control the economy overall. And they summarised this in what's called the Taylor Rule. 
And here's the very first paper where Taylor wrote this. He said, if you look at what central banks have done, then you can say the rate of interest rate which they set is the inflation rate plus a gap between actual output and maximum capacity divided by two plus the inflation rate minus two divided by two plus two. You notice number two turns up a lot there. Okay. That's one reason they think the inflation rate should be 2%. When you see all the stuff, you'll see this Bank of England talking about the targets that the bank set for themselves. They all assume the inflation rate should be 2%. And this is why, that particular model. But now what it has is now a role for economists in the model. Because what economists are supposed to do is look at inflation rate, look at uh, actual um, output, which is the Y, work out what it should really be, full, full employment capacity utilisation, and set their interest rates so that you, whenever the, whenever the economy is growing too slowly, you drop the interest rate. Whenever the inflation is taking off, you increase the interest rate. And therefore, the, policy, the economists in the central bank, independent of the government, that's their role, and they'll keep the economy on an equilibrium track. Now, I've got a feeling if I go any more than here, I'm going to really totally overload your minds here. Is that a good point to stop at? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. I can see people getting exhausted here. So we'll come back next week and I'll finish off more of this. Uh, it's still a long way to go. I've got to, uh, where am I up to now? I'm up to just about halfway. Okay?